Welcome in to the Hogbeat Hour, first episode of the season. I'm your host, Mason Cho, joined alongside by Andrew Hutchinson, managing editor of hogbeat.com, award-winning journalist, award-winning dad, award-winning husband, uh, stat guy. I mean, what else is there to describe Andrew Hutchinson as? He's a great guy and uh, happy to be alongside you, Andrew. How are you doing? Doing good, Mason. That's uh, that's one heck of an introduction. I don't know if I'll be able to live up to it. Yeah, I, I think that you'll have no issue living up to it. We're also joined by Alex Trader, Hogbeat.com reporter. He's doing a great job over there. You can go check out his content on Hogbeat.com. That's the Arkansas Rivals website. Um, we got a lot to get to today, guys. A lot to get to. Um, we basically have to pack in all of fall camp into this one episode because Rice is next week. So, um there's a lot to get to but I think we'll get to most of it because Hutch is uh Hutch is good at what he does and he's got a lot of content to talk about so let's start with just a general general fall camp talk Hutch what have you seen so far and what has really stood out to you that you know some people might not know well I mean the thing everyone always wants to talk about whether it's spring ball fall camp whatever it's the quarterback play and uh this year there was really really no drama uh, as far as who the starter was going to be, we knew KJ Jefferson is the guy. Uh, there was a little bit of drama as far as who the backup was going to be. Uh, Malik Hornsby, uh, talented redshirt freshman. Uh, we got to see, I think, two snaps of him last year as a true freshman, so not much. Uh, but he's a, a heralded recruit, and uh, he came in as the the quarter the, the number two quarterback, and he's maintained that throughout camp. You know, despite uh, some guys kind of challenging. Uh, for that number three spot, which uh, I guess it sounds like John Stephen Jones has been named the third string quarterback, which is a little bit surprising. Uh, that, I guess, came out during Sam Pittman's uh, Wednesday night radio show at the Catfish Hall. Uh, but uh, that's, so, I mean, that, that's probably the, the number one topic everyone talks about every year is, is who's going to be the quarterback. And uh, it sounds like KJ Jefferson is really kind of uh, taken that role and run with it. Uh, he has become more of a leader, more of a vocal leader. Uh, he's talked to the media like two or three times throughout camp. And, and I've been really impressed with how he's improved, just how he you know, handles the media duties, which is something he's going to have to do quite a bit throughout the season as a starting quarterback. So uh, I feel like Arkansas feels, I feel like Arkansas feels good about this quarterback position. I don't know how confident I am. I think he's going to be good, but it's still kind of an unknown, you know, even though we have seen a little, you know, we've seen him have success against Missouri last year, uh, but they know who he, that he is the guy unquestioned. There's not a, like a, a quarterback battle that's going to linger into the season like Arkansas have seen in the past. Uh, I want to get Alex in on this as well, because he's been out there doing some video work. Alex, have you really seen anything different from KJ Jefferson in fall camp compared to what we saw last year during the season? Have you seen any improvements, anything that looks a little bit better with mechanics, the way he's throwing, stuff like that? Because we've heard Kendall Bryles say that his accuracy is better, his movement is better, but um, have you been able to see that on the field and in the film? Yeah, and I mean, we've seen a lot more of him this fall camp than we did last season, and you're seeing every couple of days he's going he's gonna to drop a throw right where it needs to be, and then um, the receiver will either make a great catch or it'll kind of kind of just slip out of his hands but you're seeing those throws be where they need to be you're not seeing him miss many of those those quick slant routes or those posts putting it behind them it's where it's got to be and I think that's kind of what this team's going to need if if they're going to go out and perform up to the level of expectations that they have all right guys sticking with offense here um running back has been interesting because we know what Traylon Smith brings to the table um, I talked to his offseason trainer last year, actually, and he told me that he believed that Traylon was one of the best running backs in the SEC. And this is a guy who trains NFL talent. He also trains Isaiah Spiller from Texas A&M. Um, and he really, like, he told me that Traylon Smith should have been starting over Akeem Boyd all year. Um, so whatever that tells you. But we know what Traylon Smith brings. We know he's going to have a bigger role. Rocket Sanders, been one of the biggest stories in camp so far. Hutch. What do you think of Rocket Sanders, and do you think that there might be a RBA and RBB at number one between Smith and Sanders, or do you think it's all Smith's job and then Sanders will contribute? Yeah, I think I think Traylon Smith is the guy. Uh, I think he's 
probably one of the more underrated offensive players in the SEC just because he does he hasn't really gotten much preseason love. I mean, he's put up very similar numbers to the guys that were preseason all SEC and he didn't land on first, second or third team uh, by the the media or the coaches, which I thought was a little bit surprising because he did have really solid numbers. And that was with, as you said, you know, backing up Rakeem Boyd for a big chunk of the season. Uh, I think if he was the starter all year, he probably, he, he may have had a, a legit shot at being a, a thousand yard back in a 10 game season against all SEC opponents. And that, that is saying something. So I think Traylon Smith is the guy, uh, but Rocket Sanders has really impressed me throughout camp. I mean, I, I was a little bit unsure. He, he showed flashes during the spring, you know, cause he was an early enrollee. Uh, but again, he was, he was a guy Arkansas recruited as a wide receiver. And I don't think he's ever really played running back in his career. He's got obviously the athleticism and things like that, but he's never played the position, especially at a level like the SEC. Uh, so he was a little bit up and down and really didn't, didn't really separate himself during the spring, but here, here in the fall, you know, you could tell he just got a better understanding. He feels more comfortable out there uh, and he looks like an SEC running back. And he's also bigger than Traylon Smith. So I could see him being used in certain situations, you know, needing to run between the tackles and uh, things like that, you know, just cause he's bigger. Uh, but I, I still think he's, there's a pretty clear, you know, RB one and RB two. And he's wearing that coveted number five jersey, which some people think should be retired. I think I might be among that group of people. But um, aside from those two, who we know are going to be one and two, you got guys like Dominic Johnson, Josh Oglesby, uh, TJ Hammonds even, um, Hutch and Alex, you can get, on, get in on this as well. Who do we see as the three back? And do we see it as kind of maybe a running back by committee when it comes to the three back or – is there a clear guy that is going to be number three? Yeah, to me, I think it's going to be kind of by committee and going to be situational. Like, you know, Josh Oglesby, you mentioned him. He is an All-American sprinter on the track team, but he's also 5'7", 170. So he's, he's not very big. Uh, he's not a guy you're probably going to want to run, you know, 15 times a game or something like that, uh, which obviously you wouldn't need that from your number three back anyways. Uh, but he does have that elite – you know, potentially game-changing speed where if he gets out in space, he could do something. Uh, Dominic Johnson, he's the biggest running back in the group. He's even bigger than Rocket Sanders. Uh, maybe he's a guy that could be used even in like, you know, short yardage situations or, you know, things like that. You know, he actually got a stint with the tight ends during camp. Uh, so obviously they feel like he must, you know, block decent. So maybe he could be a guy that could go in there and, and protect and, and block, you uh, plow you know open holes or something like that tj hammonds i think he's the ultimate swiss army knife he could line up in the backfield he could go split out in the in the slot he could run routes uh so i think you're going to see all those guys you know another guy aj green is another freshman i think we're going to get to see a lot of him uh, he's just been banged up in camp but he is just oozing with potential speed uh, he could be kind of a mix of these you know smaller backs like smith and hammonds and oglesby but also, you know, he's bigger than them, but also not quite as big as, say, a Rocket Sanders or Dominique Johnson. So uh, there, there's definitely talent in that room. But outside of Traylon Smith, we, we don't really know what they can do at the college level. All right, we'll move on to the offensive line who's going to be protecting for those running backs. Um, it, it's a big deal that you return all five of your starters from last year. That's another year under offensive line guru Sam Pittman. So, uh, of course, they have to get better. I, I'm pretty sure most of them have put on weight. There was a stat, like, before before they – or before Pittman got here when they were under Chad Morris, the average weight of the offensive lineman was under 300 pounds, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And now they're sitting at about, like, what, 317, 318 average weight per, per guy. So they're going to be pushing some bodies around. We know Ricky Stromberg has had some injury issues – so, Hutch, is there a timetable with Stromberg when he's going to come back? And then there's there's a battle at left guard as well. Um, who do you see prevailing there? Well, luckily, Stromberg has actually been back at practice the last couple of days. Uh, you know, he's, he's even out of the green jersey and, and has been going through uh, practice like normal. Uh, so I, I expect he's fine and, and good to go. Uh, left guard has been an interesting battle. You know, Brady Latham 
was the guy who started last year as a redshirt freshman, landed on the uh, all SEC uh, freshman team. Uh, and Luke Jones is, is obviously, he was a, an in-state kid who went to Notre Dame for a year and then transferred back in to, to Arkansas and has kind of battled his, you know, fought his way up the depth chart. And uh, he, I think that's going to be Brady Latham. He seems to be taking most of the first team reps, but the coaching staff has been convinced that it's still a battle. So maybe Luke Jones is, you know, maybe, well, you know, maybe the number six or number seven offensive lineman uh, out there. So if there is an injury or something, uh, then he's, he's available there, but you know, something else to watch is Ty Clary who moved into center whenever Ricky Stromberg was out. And before that was a starting right guard, you know, he's, he's in a green Jersey. Now we don't, we don't know what injury he's dealing with, but it, it must've been something maybe uh, during uh, the, the, the past scrimmage because he's been in green this week and, uh, you know, but even whenever they do individual drills where the green jerseys can participate in, he was lining up with the second team offensive line behind Bo Limmer. So uh, there may be a competition at right guard as well. I, I'm not 100% sure, but that just based on what we get to see, the little bit we get to see of practice, that's what it appears like to me. All right. I, I mean, I, I agree with you there. Um, I think, but I do really think that this offensive line is going to be improved. Um, I, I think there's no question there. They're going to be pushing some bodies around. They're not going to get pushed around as much as they did the past few years. Um, and I, I think you're going to see that transition into a better running game, better pass blocking, which you need for a guy like KJ Jefferson, who he said he's not going to run a whole lot and he's not looking to run, but he's probably going to be out of the pocket here and there. So um, we'll move on to wide receiver, though. And Alex, I'll ask you first. We know what Trey Lundberg brings to the table. We know that, I mean – preseason all sec first team preseason all american i mean he's got he's got the accolades but let's look at the number two slot and the people who are going to be competing behind him we know some names we've heard some names we know davion warren um but who do you see as a guy who's gonna you know step step onto the stage and do well this year behind Traylon burks um maybe a keytron jackson who we've heard has improved um who, who are you looking at alex yeah, you nailed two of them there. I think the big story at wide receiver this year is going to be uh, whether or not the depth ends up coming through and being as effective as it can be. You've got guys like Jaqueline Crawford. You've got Keytron, as you mentioned, uh, Tyson Morris. And then Trey Knox is still in the mix. He had, he had a huge freshman year and then kind of tapered off a little bit last year. I'll be interested to see what all those guys are able to do and if one is truly able to emerge into that that second second guy behind Traylon Burks. Much. Yeah, I mean, there, there's lots of options there. I mean, I think the one everyone's all excited about is Keytron Jackson, just because he is a true freshman. Uh, and, and I mean, heck, Sam Pittman said the other day that he thinks he's at least the third best receiver on the team, could be higher, which obviously we know Burks is number one. Uh, so that would maybe mean he could be potentially the second best receiver on the team. And that would be uh, pretty awesome if, if he could live up to the hype there. Uh, but he is a true freshman, and it is hard. I mean, even Traylon Burks, who it, I think we all can agree is just a freak of nature, uh, and this also could have been part of you know the coaching staff at the time. But in 2019, when he was a true freshman, he only had I think like 27 catches, something like that, for 400 something yards. So it's not like he put up you know huge massive numbers as a true freshman, uh, like we see some some guys across the country. But Keytron Jackson. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't have to go out there and have 800 yards whenever you've got Traylon Burks, you know, assuming he's healthy. Uh, if he could go out there and have a Traylon Burks-like freshman year, that would just be massive for Arkansas because it could relieve some of the pressure from Traylon Burks. All right, guys, coming up in the show, we're going to talk some defense. We're going to talk a little bit of special teams. Cam Little, is he the next big thing? Is he the next Zach Hawker? Um, and then we're going to talk some recruiting and a little bit of a season preview here on the Hog Beat Hour. Welcome back into segment two of the Hog Beat Hour. I'm Mason Cho, joined alongside by managing editor of hogbeat.com, Andrew Hutchinson, and reporter from hogbeat.com, Alex Trader. Guys, we talked a lot of offense in the last segment, but we got to talk about that defense. That's, I mean, it's a defense that returns a lot of talent. You got the two leading tacklers in the SEC at linebacker from last year. Jalen Catalan, who some people say might be the best safety who's ever come through Arkansas. Um, 
But defensive line is where I want to start. Because last year, the entire defensive line was Jonathan Marshall, and he's gone. So, Hutch, I'll start with you. We, they got some transfers, uh, two Missouri guys, the Illinois State guy, John Ridgway. Um, what do you see that defensive line doing this year? Where do you see it shaking out as far as who does what? And uh, maybe even the returning guys. I mean, you got guys like Isaiah Nichols, Eric Gregory, who, you know, can help. But what, what do you see that happening, happening there? I think the first thing you notice about the defensive line is there's a lot more depth. I mean, you mentioned they brought in three transfers, you know, the returning guys is, you know, pretty much everybody except for Jonathan Marshall. Uh, So there are definitely a lot of pieces there. I think there's guys that are capable of playing in the sec. The question is, do they have a big time pass rusher? Do they have somebody like a Trey flowers or Dietrich wise or, or someone like that who can really get after the quarterback? And I'm just not 100% sure yet. And I mean, part of that is because all we've seen is spring ball and fall camp, and you can't you can't do anything with quarterbacks. You know, you can't you can't actually tackle them or anything like that. So, is is one of those guys capable of being that? I mean, Trey Williams, uh, one of the Missouri transfers, I think could be that guy. And he showed flashes uh, at Missouri. Uh, he's a former four star recruit uh, and was was heralded coming out of high school. And, you know, had some success under Barry Odom. You know, could he have success under Barry Odom here at Arkansas? Could he be a guy that gets after the quarterback? I think it's possible. He, he did miss a day of practice this week uh, with an injury. He was back in green yesterday, uh, which I think is a good sign with, with, you know, the game still over a week away. Uh, but I, I, I think that he could be that guy. But I think we're going to see a lot of different pieces, especially in this Rice game. I think we're going to see a lot of defensive linemen until they really figure out who their top guys are. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you there. The depth is there, but are you going to have a guy who just stands out? Like, I mean, Jonathan Marshall last year. You said it, Trey Flowers, Dietrich Wise. Like, you need one of those guys because this is the SEC. You have to get pressure, and Arkansas hasn't been able to do that in recent years. And that's why they're getting scored on so much. You know, if you can't create pressure, then that just leaves the field wide open for them. So um, defensive line is going to be interesting. But I want to talk about linebacker. We know what's going on with Grant Morgan and Bumper Pool, Hayden Henry as well. Who do you see coming in behind those guys, um, Hutch? Because they're going to be on the field most of the time. But who's going to come in when they're tired and they got to go out? Yeah, I mean, I honestly think those three guys, which, you know, I think is worth noting, too, everyone kind of assumes, you know, Grant Morgan and Bumper Pool are going to be the starters. But based on what I've seen in camp, I think Hayden Henry might start over Bumper Pool. Uh, I think that that is a legitimate possibility. Apparently, they've been rotating. But every time I've been watching, you know, the team segment, when we get to see them actually run, you know, ones on ones, twos on twos, it's been Hayden Henry with the ones. So, uh, that that may be something to watch, but I, I really think you know when one of those two guys gets tired, it's going to be bumper pull rotating in or vice versa or whatever. I, I see those three guys taking I don't know ninety percent of the linebacker snaps. I, I really do. Uh, the the next group, I mean, I think Andrew Parker is, is the first name that comes to mind. He's played, he's got a significant number of snaps under his belt. He's a redshirt junior at this point. Uh, I think he's probably that next guy. Uh, but I think a name everyone wants to see more of is is Chris Paul. Uh, he's a true freshman. I just don't know if he's going to really crack the rotation enough because I feel like if, say, those top three guys take 90% of the snaps, I would see Andrew Parker taking 5% of that, and then that remaining 5% would probably be split between guys like Deion Edwards. He's another super senior. Hasn't played a whole lot, though, so I don't see him playing a ton this year. Uh, Jackson Woodard, a walk-on who who actually played some last year as a true freshman walk-on, and then you, as I said, Chris Paul. Uh, not a lot of snaps to go around for those guys, though. When when you got that top trio, assuming they stay healthy. Uh, Alex, I want to ask you this: How big of a deal is it that Grant Morgan decided to come back as a super senior to play for Sam Pittman after he led the SEC in tackles last year, by far the best season of his career? How big of a deal is it that you know he showed? hey, I want to play for you guys, and I want to win some more games at Arkansas. 
it's a huge deal and one thing he's talked about in his time with the with in the media sessions has been the brotherhood that they kind of have as that linebacking core and as that defense you know they'll go and they'll play pool um they'll they'll kind of just hang out and do whatever they can to try and stay close as a unit and i think that shows when you're on the field and you're able to trust the guy next to you uh, you just really hope that he's able to bring back that same level of production that he had last season if he can build on that that season he had last year then you're really going to have a, a strong center of that linebacking core to look to all right going to another position battle it's at cornerback there's a lot of talent there um a lot of guys who played last year and did well uh we know the struggles that you know hudson clark had he had that one big game but then there were a lot of times he got burned um joe fouché though he he's good Eric Brooks or uh, Greg Brooks, sorry, Greg Brooks Jr. He's good as well. Um, Hutch, how do you see that shaking out? Who's going to play where in the secondary? And uh, do you see one of those guys just really breaking out this year and, you know, getting a step above of the others? I think the, the, the top, I mean, obviously the secondary is led by, you know, in the safeties uh, with, with Jalen Catalan, but as far as the other guys, that maybe aren't quite as known. I think Monteric Brown is going to be potentially an all SEC caliber corner. Uh, I think he, he's got the, he's got one side of that field locked down uh, as far as a starting job is concerned. And I, I really think he could be really good. He, he is steadily, you know, graded out higher on pro football focus each year. And uh, I, I think he's going to be a guy uh, that that can be an all SEC caliber guy. Now the other side, that's kind of where the battle is, and and it it seemed to be between Ladarius Bishop and Hudson Clark. Uh, it seems like Ladarius Bishop has pulled ahead in that battle. Uh, he is by far the most athletic. I mean, he may be the most athletic guy in that secondary. He's super fast and just just tons of raw talent. Uh, it's a matter of can he, you know utilize that talent to to actually be effective out there and, and I think he can uh, Hudson Clark you mentioned him he did have that incredible game with three interceptions against Ole Miss uh, but did struggle however I've seen him I, I feel like he's improved this camp I, I was watching some one-on-ones the other day in, in practice and he had a couple of nice really pass breakups which is really really tough to do in one-on-ones it's it's set up for the receiver to to succeed more times than not and to have two pass breakups like he did was pretty impressive. So I wouldn't count him out. I, I fully expect him to play as well. Uh, but I think those three guys are probably your top corners, you know, in, in Clark, Bishop, and then, of course, Brown. So as a whole, how do you see this defense improving from last year? You know, they get another year under Barry Odom, who probably had plenty of head coaching offers from, the, from around the country. So um, where do you see them improving the most? And do you see them taking care of SEC offenses more than they have, like actually stopping them and giving their offense more of a chance to succeed and score? I think it all hinges on the success of the defensive line. We talked about it earlier. If the defensive line can get some pressure on the quarterback, then I think they have a chance to be a top half of the SEC type defense. And that would mean really good. Uh, But it doesn't matter how good your secondary is or how good your linebackers are if your defensive line is just completely ineffective. If the quarterback has all day to stand back there, I I don't care if you have the the greatest uh, defensive backs of all time, their receivers are going to get open and they're going to get picked apart. Uh, So I really think it all depends on what happens up front. But I, I do believe they're going to be better up front. So having said that, I do think they are going to make a step forward You've got two legitimate All-American candidates in Grant Morgan and Jalen Catalan. So you've got the pieces to be a really good uh, defense. Alex, do you have anything to add to that? Do you, do you agree with the D-line? Is there something else that you think might be better this year that would make this push this defense over the edge to being a top half of the SEC defense? I think Hutch nailed it on the head. You've got that uh, uh, depth on the defensive line and and you've got guys who are coming in and are already familiar with Barry Odom's schemes. You've got Trey Williams and you've got Jonathan or uh, yeah, John Ridgway coming in from Illinois state who has been a force. And he has, you know, he, he said when he was entering the, the, 
portal, he felt like a five-star guy when he was being recruited out of there. And, you know, you're going to have to see some kind of a jump in production for it to happen. But I think middle of the pack is something you definitely want to shoot for uh, in the SEC. All right. So let's hit some special teams, though. Uh, I'm surprised how big of a story it's been with Cam Little. But then it's not surprising because how much has Arkansas struggled in special teams in the years recently with, you know, Chad Morris, the, the fake punt, and then the, the punt return with North Texas. And it's been bad. Um, word is Cam Little is the real deal. Uh, Hutch, what have you seen from him in camp? And do you think that he's going to, like, do really good like people say he's going to do? Or do you think that there's more of like a position battle there with maybe Vito Calvaruso or something like that? I think, uh, I think Cam Little is the guy. Uh, I mean, you bring him in as a scholarship guy, you hope that he's going to be the guy. And I, I really believe he is. Uh, we, we don't really get to see a whole lot of the specialists during practice, uh, but by all accounts, he has been the most consistent field goal kicker, better than Matthew Phillips, better than Vito Calvaruso. Uh, so I think he's going to be uh, the field goal specialist. He's still, he, he is a true freshman. So I, I expect him to be a little bit up and down, uh, but you hope to think, you'd like to think he's better than maybe say a Cole Headland who like Cam came in as a heralded kicker, scholarship kicker and didn't work out. So I, I, I think he's going to be better than that. And I think he has a chance as time goes on to evolve into a superstar stud kicker for Arkansas. That's good to hear. That's, that's really good news. Um, I it's another crazy thing is how important it is who the starter starting punter is going to be. That's been like such a big deal for Arkansas recently because it's just been terrible. I mean, how many block punts did they have last year? Three or four, I think. And that was like really close to top in the country. It was just, it was bad. Um, the averages have been bad. We've heard some names. Hutch, who, who do you think is going to take that starting punter? And do you think that maybe they switched in and out like they have? Or do you think someone's going to take over and just be the guy? Well, right now, Sam Loy, you know, he entered fall camp as probably the number one kicker or number one punter. And he's been hurt the last week, two weeks maybe. Uh, don't know the status of his injury, but that would make it really easy. Then you're going to go with Reed Bauer, who – you know, both of those guys have experience as the starting punter. I mean, Reed Bauer was a starter in 2018 as a true freshman. And then again, uh, started a good chunk of last year as uh, after uh, George Carrington had his early season struggles with the block punts, as you mentioned. Uh, so uh, he's, he's an option. And then Sam Loy, he's, he was the primary punter in 2019. He didn't have great punt like distance, like his average punts were only like 38, 39 yards, which isn't great in the sec you usually like to see it you know north of 40 but he was getting elite hang time where opposing teams were not able to return punts which as we've seen with arkansas you don't want teams returning punts because the coverage units have also been atrocious so uh, i think he's a legit candidate but also i wouldn't count out reed bauer because he just seems to he just seems to always be there and and right in the middle of the competition so i i'm not sure you know it all probably depends on how healthy sam loy is uh, come September 4th. All right, I'm going to get with Alex on this one. As far as kick returner goes and punt returner, it's it's been atrocious as well. All special teams has been atrocious. Um, I believe Arkansas only had four punt returns last year for like 16 yards, something like that. And it, that's just bad. We've heard some names. We've heard Scott Fountain say that they're making that a big deal this year. We have to have playmakers at – returner is what scott fountain said so we've heard some names who do you think is going to shine there you've been out at practice you've been seeing the speed of these guys are, are there any guys that you think is really going to take over maybe maybe get some touchdowns uh yeah you know in, the, in that limited 20 minute window we get we're not really seeing much of the return side of things that they'll move into that uh usually after but i, I think names names we've heard bryce stevens has been tossed around greg brooks is, has been a guy who's w wanting to get in there and asking hey can i go make a play can i can i get my shot back there to to be the guy to kind of fix these struggles and i think um, that want to is something that's going to be huge for the special teams and it's going to start building towards hopefully better results for the team. 
Uh, do you have anything to add there? Any any more names, guys, that you think are going to stand out this year? So, I mean, the, the Bryce Stevens and Greg Brooks are probably the top two options for punt returner. It uh, sounds like Greg Brooks is probably the leader. Uh, as far as kickoff return, I want to say they've, they've mentioned Ladarius Bishop, you know, the, the speedy corner. I said he's he may be the fastest guy on the team. So uh, that would be good. You know, I'm trying to remember who else. I mean, it, it's really – it's kind of a crapshoot because they can't – they can't practice it full speed in, in practice because they're worried about injuries and, and things like that. Uh, but it sounds like him, Miles Slusher is a name I've heard thrown around some. Uh, to, you know, Josh Oglesby, I think, and, and TJ Hammonds have gotten some looks back there. You know, those are you know elite speed guys. Uh, I think that's really the number one thing on kickoff return is, is speed. Uh, punt return, you need somebody who can actually catch the punt and also maybe is a little bit more – elusive compared to just fast so uh it's gonna be interesting to see i i'm I'm really anxious to see if they can get some production from special teams this year because we can't say it enough they were so bad last year they need to be better yeah yeah they not just last year like the past three years it's just been atrocious so i mean it it's almost like you just can't get worse so but we we shall see coming up next we're going to talk about a Razorback that retired. Um, we're going to hit some preseason accolades and some more news on the hog beat hour. And then there's some quarterback battles going on for the first two opponents that the hogs play. Back here on the hog beat hour, I'm your host, Mason Chode, alongside managing editor of hogbeat.com, Andrew Hutchinson, and hog beat reporter Alex Trader. Having a great time here. We're going to hit some news now. So another Razorback player has retired, Hutch. Um, this time, Coylan Jackson. He was playing tight end. Um, joins Levi Draper and Noah Gatlin to retire for the Hogs this offseason. Um, just what do you know about that situation, and how is it going to affect Arkansas? Yeah, Coylan is a guy that has battled injuries his entire career. He had a, a torn ACL that uh, basically wiped out his, his true freshman year that caused him to redshirt. Uh, he had a knee surgery at some point last year that that ended his season early uh, so uh, he's he just always had knee injuries and just really unfortunate I don't really think it impacts Arkansas too much he was a wide receiver that converted to tight ends and was was running with the tight ends but it, it seems like you know Hudson Henry Blake Kern and maybe even Nathan Bax are kind of the top guys there uh, so he probably going to contribute more than maybe on special teams would have been cool for him though you know he had you know, moved to tight end and also changed his jersey number to 88, which is, you know, just like his dad, Keith Jackson, uh, the legendary tight end, went to Oklahoma and played in the NFL for several years, uh, was a tight end and also wore number 88. That would have been cool for him, but unfortunately uh, wasn't meant to be. He had to, to retire and, uh, you know, I can't, I can't blame a guy for that. You know, you, you don't want to be, you know, 30 years old and can't walk because you have messed up knees. So, uh, best of luck to him, and uh, same thing with you know Levi Draper, chronic shoulder injuries. Uh, Noah Gatlin back in the spring, I think it was concussion uh, issues. So uh, those guys have you know made made the best choice for them, and and you, you wish them the best. And we didn't get to talk tight end really in our offensive segment earlier, so I, I want to ask Alex here. As far as tight end goes, you know th there were big expectations for Hudson Henry when he came to Arkansas, of course you know, he's a Henry. Um, so that's a big deal, first of all. And second of all, he hasn't really done much. Um, you know, last year I projected him or predicted him to be the breakout player for the Arkansas offense, and he really let me down. So do you see him doing any better this year, or do you see Blake Kern kind of getting even better? How, how do you see tight end position shaking out? Uh, I think those two guys you mentioned are, are probably going to take the brunt of the reps. They, they have been at the front of the line during all the individual drills. Um, you know, I, I think tight end is a position where you have kind of have to have a little bit of size to be as effective because there is that blocking aspect of things and you're supposed to be the guy that goes up and gets the ball. Um, so I, I think just another year of physicality will help out Hudson here. Um, and, and, you know, his brother is an NFL player. So there is, you know, the option there to go get tips and say, Hey, you know, what am I doing here that I could be doing better? So I'm expecting a, a bit of a jump for, for him. And then also some great production from Kern there as well. 
Butch, I want to ask you here. It seems like tight end position for Arkansas is like, hey, if it's not working out where you're at, go play tight end. Um, we know Landon Rogers has moved to tight end now, which makes sense for him because he's a huge, huge dude. He's like 6'5", 215, right? Um, something like that. But what do you think it is with players going over to tight end? And uh, why, why do you think that that – why do you think that happens for the Hawks? They just don't have depth at the position. I mean, these guys that are moving over there aren't going to be asked to play next week. I mean, they, they are more – projects and that's because they're also far down on the depth chart at their you know other positions I mean Landon Rogers you mentioned him he was probably well one to six string quarterback maybe uh, so he wasn't going to get to play quarterback this year so why not move him over to tight end uh, and you know he's he's not only is he big and built like a tight end but he's also crazy athletic so uh, I think that's a good move for him but I mean if you think about it in the last two years We've seen a defensive end uh, go over there and play tight end in Eric Thomas. We saw Blaine Toll go back and forth between defensive end, tight end, and back again several times. We saw uh, an offensive lineman, uh, Marcus Henderson, go play tight end some. Uh, this offseason, we saw wide receiver Coylan Jackson move over to tight end, uh, which is a, a relatively common move. We've seen uh, Levi Draper, a linebacker, before he medically retired, move over to tight end from linebacker. Uh, we've seen Landon Rogers. We've seen Dominique Johnson. I mentioned him, a running back, move over to tight end. So literally, if any, I mean, we're, I think we're, we're just like one step away from seeing, you know, Vito Calvaruso go over there and play tight end or something. I mean, it, it's crazy. It, it's unreal. They just, they need depth. And, and I think they are addressing that on the recruiting trail, but that's, a year or two down the line. Yeah, it is impressive what Dow Logan has done so far on the recruiting trail at tight end. Um, I do just want to mention that it's crazy that freshman Landon Rogers looks older than all three of us combined. He, <laughs> I mean, just like full grown beard. Dude looks like he's like 30 years old already. So and I just had to throw that in, throw that in there because every time I see him, I'm just like, what the heck? Um but here we go. We got to hit some preseason accolades, and there's a lot, so I'm going to read it off of the list. Uh, Jalen Catalan, second team preseason AP All American. Not no surprise there. Um, six players on the preseason All SEC team voted on by the coaches. So you got Burke Stromberg and Grant Morgan all on the first team. Second team you got Catalan, which is a little surprising to me. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of talent at safety in the SEC. Third team you got Myron Cunningham and Ty Clary. And then also, Pro Football Focus has top 100 NFL draft prospects. Traylon Burks at number 26, Jalen Catalan at number 61. Um, also want to mention on the ESPN top 100 players in college football this year, Traylon Burks landed on there and so did Grant Morgan. So um, that's a lot to go around for a team that last year people were talking about there's no good players on this team and here we are talking about all these preseason accolades, two guys who are possible first-round draft picks, Traylon Burks and Jalen Catalan. How, how crazy do you think that is, Hutch, and how, how much does that show that what Sam Pittman is doing is working? It's pretty remarkable if you think about it. I mean, this is a team that went 3-7 and seven last year that had lost, I can't even remember now, 20, 21 SEC games in a row, you know, until they finally won last year. So – the, the fact that they have three legitimate All-American caliber players is pretty incredible. I mean, you know, Jalen Catalan's a second-team preseason All-American. You could honestly make a case for Burks and Morgan. Uh, honestly, I think, you know, both of them may have been snubbed. But I can also say see why, why they wouldn't want to have three guys from a 3-7 and seven team that's picked to finish sixth in the SEC West this year on the preseason All-American team. So that's why I think that there is potential – for this team to be better than we all expect. Now, I, I still think it would be a great season if they make a bowl game, but they have pieces. They have the talents. You know, they, they may not have the depth of the other, you know, high caliber SEC teams, but they have talents, you know, top line talent. So it, it is remarkable. And I do want to note too, you know, it, it is surprising that the Jalen Catalan was a second team all SEC pick. Uh, but I want to note that, the coaches and even the media, the preseason teams, they don't differentiate between corners and safeties. It's just four defensive backs. And so if you look at the first team of all SEC, you've got three corners and a nickel. 
as the, the top defensive backs. So Jalen Catalan is still, by all accounts, one of the top one or two safeties in the SEC. I don't like how they do that because I think corner and safety are two different positions, but uh, that, that's how they do it. So is, we kind of know that preseason accolades don't really mean anything for the most part. I mean, it's cool to see names on a list, but it all matters what happens during the season and how you end the year. So are, out of all these names and maybe even names that weren't on lists, are there some guys that you see actually reaching that potential and maybe exceeding um, what the expectation is for them? I mean, I, I think we could say Burks and Catalan probably, but are there any other names and – um, kind of how do you see that shaking out and maybe some awards later on in the postseason? I think that that entire trio, you know, Burks, Catalan and Morgan, I think they're going to get all the accolades you can get. Uh, I, I really do. If Morgan doesn't win the Burlesworth award this year, then I don't know if an Arkansas player will ever win it. I thought he was robbed last year. Uh, but uh, outside of those guys, I mean, some some guys I think could really earn some some solid accolades. You know, Myron Cunningham at left tackle. I think he's solid. And as I said earlier, I think Traylon Smith is one of the more underrated running backs in the SEC. I think he's very capable of having a 1,000 yard season and, and earning, you know, maybe not first team All SEC, but I could see him getting some second team nods or, or something like that. So uh, th those are guys that come to mind. You know, Monteric Brown, again, I think he's a, a really solid corner and could be an All SEC caliber player. Uh, there, there are talented people, as I said, on this roster. Uh, they just all got to stay healthy. Alex. I want to ask you, running back room, how does this running back room rank as far as, you know, maybe the past decade? Because uh, there's there's so much talent and so much depth. I mean, you got a lot of really high-rated recruits in this running back room, Traylon Smith coming in um, from a couple of years ago, but then you got Rocket Sanders, A.J. Green. There, there's a lot of depth. What do you see this running back room doing? Do you see Rocket Sanders maybe being a – freshman all sec team something like that How, what do you think is going to happen there uh you know i don't i don't want to rank it off the top of my head right here but i i, I do think there's some merit to rocket sanders you know depending on how the, how the carries are divvied up and how much Traylon smith is able to do as that kind of workhorse back uh, if he's out there carrying the load and and, and putting up a ton of carries and you might not see rocket Sanders have that same kind of impact, but if it's kind of a committee approach um, and they're able to have all those guys be efficient with the carries that they're given, then I certainly think there's room for, for a bunch of different guys, you know, Hutch mentioned them earlier, Smith, uh, Sanders, Oglesby green. I think all these guys are going to have their different niches and where they're able to plug in best. And I think, if they are all able to be effective with that, then it's going to be a very solid group for, uh, for Kendall Bryles to work with. All right, guys. I, I think that's a good wrap up for fall camp. Now let's look to moving forward. Rice next week. Uh, a lot of people were looking past that game because you have a huge game the next week, Texas, but let's talk about rice first, Alex, you've been looking at their offense. I'm pretty sure there's still a quarterback battle going on there. Um, what, what do you see from rice so far? How do you think that they're going to match up against the Hogs as far as – let's just start with the quarterback battle they got going on. Yeah, so this quarterback battle is is really the one out of those those first four weeks where we're not really seeing anything. We, we saw the other two kind of have a bit of a, a wrap-up yesterday, but you've got Luke McCaffrey and you've got Wiley Green, and they're both taking first-team reps. Um, the, the guy who kind of – led the team last year and Giovanni Johnson doesn't really seem to be getting much of a shake here. You know, Bloomgren, Bloomgren is not mentioning him too much, but uh, I think what they have is a unique opportunity because Wiley Green started for the team two years ago. He has 10 starts for the team, um, but he was, he was kind of replaced last year by Johnson. And then you've got a Nebraska transfer coming in who, you know, spent two weeks at Louisville and now he's back but he didn't come to the team until the middle of the summer. So uh, is he going to be ready for that week one matchup against Arkansas? It, or will they have Wiley Green taking those reps until, you know, he's likely supplanted by McCaffrey later on? All right. That, that, that's interesting. Um, I think Giovanni Johnson's a really good player. Um, I actually watched him in high school a lot. He's a very athletic dude. Accuracy was what he had to work on. I'm pretty sure he's fixed a lot of it, but they, they brought in some dudes – 
but let's look past Rice. Let's just look at the season in general. Um, Hutch, what are the realistic expectations for this team? Because I always say it, but we're kind of at about the eight and four, nine and three season in Arkansas Razorback like fandom. That's that's what predictions are saying right now. So, as far as from a journalistic standpoint, realistic standpoint, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, if if you take off the rose colored glasses, you would recognize that this probably isn't a nine win team. Uh, I mean, there's you know, I guess a path to nine wins, uh, but you literally everything has to happen right, and then you have to get lucky. So uh, I, I think more realistically, you know, I could see them winning anywhere from five to seven games. Uh, I think five wins is probably more likely than seven. I know Arkansas fans don't like to hear it. I think my I'm, – I'm leaning personally towards six and six. I don't think they can beat Texas. I know that's a game everyone's like, oh, well, we can beat Texas. It's Texas. They, they suck. But realistically, they are a good team. I don't know if they're preseason top 25 good. They always seem to be a little overranked in that regard. But it is a team that recruits consistently better than Arkansas – I think Sark is a, is a fantastic offensive mind. He's going to make it tough. They are probably going to have a, a freshman quarterback in there, but still, I, that's going to be a tough game for Arkansas. But, you know, win the other three non-conference games and, and win three SEC games, that, that gets you right at six and six and, and head into a bowl. I'm curious, what do you see as the most winnable SEC games? Because you look at teams like Ole Miss, Mississippi State, and Missouri. Those are the ones in my mind that are your most winnable games. Um, I'm sure you'll probably agree with me there, but it, it, are, there, are there any other games? Maybe LSU, maybe Auburn. Um, that's going to be a big game after what happened last year. So are there any teams that you think are almost a lock as a, an SEC win this year? I don't know if any of them are locks just because we are, it is, it is still Arkansas. It is still a program rebuilding. Uh, I don't think anyone can argue that. I mean, Sam Pittman certainly has the program on the right direction, but is it, it, are they to a point where anything's a lock? I don't think anything other than maybe UAPB is a lock for a win this year. I mean, even Rice and, and Georgia Southern are quality players quality teams they teams you should win uh and beat uh but as far as you know I, I mean you mentioned the two mississippi schools in missouri those are the most you know common answers i think auburn is another team you know getting them to come in to fayetteville the way last year's game ended probably sticks in arkansas's crawl a little bit and they're going to want to get some redemption there uh I, I could honestly see you know and having to go to oxford for the old miss game I think makes that pretty tough. I think Ole Miss is going to be good this year under Lane Kiffin. Uh, but the Missouri and Auburn at home, Mississippi State at home, those are all very winnable games for Arkansas. All right. I mean, I agree with you there. Um, Ole Miss, I mean, Matt Corral. or Is it Coral or Corral? I've never, I've never been able to figure it out. I think Corral. I'm not 100% okay. sure, though. Okay. Uh, either way, he, I mean, he's projected to be the number one quarterback in the SEC this year as far as just preseason is looking. So that'll be an interesting matchup there in Oxford. So moving forward, next segment, we're going to wrap up. We're going to talk some recruiting. Um, Hutch, you've basically taken over recruiting for Hogbeat. So we'll see what you have to say. Alex has been diving into it a little bit as well. So we'll talk to you guys about that next, and we will wrap up here on the Hogbeat Hour. Back here on the Hogbeat Hour. We're going to talk some recruiting this segment with the managing editor of Hogbeat, Andrew Hutchinson. Um, Hutch, first of all, you've kind of taken over recruiting. You got Alex. He's on the program as well. Alex is going to start doing some more recruiting, but um, we'll talk to you first, Hutch. This whole Isaac Davis thing, Ernest Green. Um, tell us kind of what happened and what's really going on. Yeah, so uh, this thing kind of went viral this week. Uh, Isaac Davis, legendary Arkansas football player, offensive lineman, early 90s, all-SEC guy, uh, played in the NFL. Uh, he posted on Facebook this week that his nephew, Ernest Green, who happens to be a top 100 recruit out in California, uh, was all he wanted for Christmas was an offer from Arkansas and Sam Pittman and that he is ready to commit. Uh, that, of course, got Arkansas fans super excited because, oh, my gosh, we've got the nephew of a famous Razorback who's a top 100 recruit, and he's an offensive lineman. Oh, my goodness, this is great. 
I hate to burst your bubble. It ain't happening, folks. He, he did get an offer from Arkansas the other day. Uh, he did post about it. Uh, but I, I reached out to some sources that are in Ernest's camp and uh, was basically told that Arkansas, there, there's definitely no interest there for, for him, uh, unfortunately. Uh, that's not exactly surprising because if you look at his top 10 list right now, it's got Alabama, Ohio State, uh, Oklahoma. I mean, th these are the kind of teams that he's looking at. Uh, unfortunately, Arkansas just is not there yet. Uh, but you know, Hey, it's a, it's a fun story. You know, Arkansas got the offer in there, you know, they shot their shot. Uh, but don't, don't get your hopes up that, that he's going to be committing anytime soon. All right. So let's, let's take a look at the 2022 class, which is basically full. Um, they're kind of moving on to 2023 already got two really good tight end commitments. What, what, you, what can you tell us about this 2022 class and, uh, how, how do you think it's going to shape up when they get to Fayetteville? Yeah, so I mean, right now, I mean, it's it's a really solid class. They got 17 commitments. Uh, it's currently ranked 15th on Rivals. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be able to maintain that top 20 ranking, uh, but it is it is solid. It's got some four stars, a lot of you know high quality three stars, uh, which people don't get excited about. But a 5.7 three star on Rivals is on the verge of being a four star recruit. So that is a really solid pickup, and they've got a lot of those kind of guys. They're probably only going to be able to sign. They, they can sign no more than 22, but that number may drop to 21 or 20, depending on, you know, say if a Warren Thompson or a, a Cade Renfro guys that came to Arkansas walk-ons this year, if they get awarded scholarships, then that'll take away a scholarship from the 2022 class. It's very confusing, but basically they're going to sign anywhere from 20 to 22 players. They're already at 17 uh, so they, they can only add a few more. And as you said, because it's already filling up so much, they've already started really hitting that 23 class uh, and landing Shamar Easter, a top 100 recruit in-state kid that was pursued by all sorts of big time programs from Ashdown. Uh, getting him to start off the class was huge. And then to follow it up the very next day with another tight end and Jaden Ham, uh, another high three star. I know some services have him as a four star. Uh, that is a solid, solid start for the class, especially for Dowell Loggins, you know, being a, a first time college head coach who's never had to recruit. Uh, that That's pretty, that's a really solid start for him uh, on the recruiting trail. Yeah, that's what I want to ask Alex about that, actually. Alex, how important do you think it is to get Loggins in here um, in a former hog, former NFL offensive coordinator? Now he's a tight ends coach and he hasn't missed a beat. How key is that for the Hogs moving forward, not just at tight end, but just in recruiting in general? I mean, the guy has over a decade of NFL experience in the coaching ranks. That's going to be interesting to some college kids. You know, he has connections in the NFL and having that experience of what it's like to be in the league, it's going to help him have a case for these kids of, Hey, I've been there. I can kind of show you the way of, of, what the process is like to get there and also pulling pulling an in-state top 100 kid is huge especially with with you know arkansas not necessarily recruiting with those alabama clemson oklahoma ohio state you have to keep the talent you have in your state and, and him doing that with easter is a giant plus for the program and then going into kansas and pulling out Jaden ham that's another giant add for this team and hutch you mentioned earlier the tight end position starting to run a little thin you know i might be out there next week if, if there's an injury in that group and um being able to start building the that depth for the for the future is is going to be big for this program hutch as far as the 2022 class goes who do you think is the key recruit from that class so far a guy that can come in here and be an immediate difference maker yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the list now. I mean, they, they've got, see, five four-star recruits. A few of those guys are, like, you know, offensive or defensive linemen. Those guys have a harder time coming in and contributing right away. I mean, Marion Harris from Joe T. Robinson and Little Rock, Nico DeVillier, defensive end from Maumelle. Those guys have all the potential in the world, but how, how are they going to be able to contribute right away uh, on, on the trenches? I'm not sure, you know. I think, you know, they've got a lot of depth right now in the secondary. So a guy like Miles Rouser, who's actually the highest rated recruit, might have a hard time cracking 
uh, the rotation immediately. So I'm looking at, you know, maybe like a wide receiver, like Quincy McAdoo, another in-state guy, four-star recruit. I could see him coming in and contributing right away. You know, we talked about the tight ends, lack of depth. You know, Blake Kern is going to be gone for sure because he's a super senior this year. And you've got a guy in Tyrus Washington who was recruited by quite a bit of, of big time schools. He's from Georgia, plays a high level of high school football. Uh, and he's a high three-star recruit on rivals. I could see him coming in and, and finding his way into the tight end rotation next year, especially if, if Sam Pittman is serious whenever he talks about wanting more uh, 12 personnel, more two tight end sets, uh, because you're, you're, as I said, you're not going to have Blake Kern. So who's going to be that second tight end along with Hudson Henry? Uh, I think Tyrus Washington could be that guy. Uh, and another one that I'm going to mention too is Jordan Crook. He's a linebacker. Uh, they flipped from Oklahoma State. Uh, he is a guy, again, this is a position that's going to need more, more bodies because you're losing Grant Morgan. You're losing Hayden Henry for sure. Bumper pool is likely gone. He could come back for a super senior season, but probably gone. I could see Jordan Crook coming in and being a guy that could contribute right away. So uh, going to be going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. There's always a surprise or two as well. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't be shocked to see a, a guy that maybe not as heralded uh, come in and, and and burst onto the scene, especially if they're early enrollees. All right, guys. Well, we're going to wrap it up here. Everything you hear, everything you hear from us, you can get it on hogbeat.com. Hutch is over there putting out content every day. Alex as well. You can follow Hutch at NWA Hutch on Twitter. Follow Arkansas Rivals. That's at Arkansas Rivals. Go check it out, hogbeat.com. A lot of great content. I mean, Hutch is VIP content. You can't get anything better. It's what you do. There's nothing better. Your fall cam notebooks. I mean, your long form stories like that Kevin Cobb story was insane, dude. So um, check out all the information that you need for Arkansas sports. It's at hogbeat.com. Check him out on Twitter. It's where he puts all of his stuff out. And uh, be looking out next week. We're going to do an in-depth rice preview on the Hogbeat Hour. And that's what you've been listening to, the Hogbeat Hour. He's been Andrew Hutchinson. He's been Alex Trader, and I've been Mason Cho. Thanks for listening.